Well, this week we're we're starting a series on building this coaling tower. It's the Chama Coaling Tower. What an undertaking! <laughs> it's been a project uh, in this scale. It stands like 40 inches tall. Wow! And uh, we've been working mostly in the switching yard, as as you guys know, but we're also working in the engine shop, and this is kind of the uh, the crown jewel of the engine shop area, and I think it's gonna end up being the most prominent building on the entire railroad. Does it have a choice? <laughs> it doesn't have a choice. At 40 <laughs> inches tall, it's just gonna dominate everything. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I need it to figure out a track plan, and so that's why I've sort of moved that uh, from the back burner to the front burner, because I can't lay the track through this section until I know where the coaling tower is going to stand and how much room it needs and therefore where I can put track and where I can't put track. Now this week we're not actually starting on the coaling tower itself. We're going to be looking at how I'm making the corrugated steel roofing panels. Oh boy. <laughs> but they look good. They look terrible, but they're supposed to look terrible. But that, to... that means it looks good. <laughs> that looks good, yeah. By railroad standards, that looks really That's good. That's excellent. But there's three sections of roof on this building that will be covered with these uh, corrugated steel roofing panels. And then uh, the other remaining roof will be done in tar paper. So I needed to start making these and uh, figuring out how many I need and, and get the weathering on them. So I thought I'd share that with the, the process with everybody because it's actually pretty neat. Now this process was, uh, was handed off to us by our good friend Steve Stribble. I don't really know if he came up with the idea or if he heard about it somewhere. These are uh, some roofing panels that he made uh, for his O-Scale Railroad. He models in ON3 and ON30. And this is the same process that he uses, although because his panels are smaller, he has to use a somewhat different process. But the panels are made out of this stuff. It's aluminum foil, but it's a heavier uh, aluminum foil, a craft foil that we got off of uh, Amazon. But it's much stiffer than the stuff you use in the kitchen. It's in fact 36 gauge aluminum metal foil. And here's the Amazon page that we ordered that from. If a person were working in a much smaller scale, they might actually want to use the kitchen variety of this. Now here's a critical tool. Again, uh, Steve Stribble put us on to this. It only works in the larger scales, half inch, 32nd scale might work, but where we're doing 120th scale, it's just perfect. But this thing is a tube squeezer and it's intended for squeezing paint out of tubes. Artists use that to get their, uh, their acrylic paints, their expensive paints out. Here's the, uh, the, the Amazon page that we ordered that from. They make a much more expensive version of this that sells for around $40, but I can't see that that really benefits in any way. This little $10 job works just fine. But here's how it works. You open the squeezer, you put in your tube of paint, you pinch the thing down and you turn the roller. Now, since we're not actually squeezing paint out of a tube or toothpaste or whatever, we're just going to load our foil strips in there and corrugate them. Now, as the corrugator is three inches wide, I thought, well, I can cut my strips to three inches and the roll is 12 inches. So I ended up with these three by 12 inch strips, but those proved to be completely unmanageable. They would get off to one side and, uh, start going off at an angle and then jam and start bending the edge of it. So what I ultimately ended up doing is cutting these strips down to just under two inches and then only four inches long and then that worked out just fine. It's good you've got plenty. Yeah. But anyway, that's how you do that without it getting off. Yeah. Off again. There's no keeping it straight. It just wanders all by itself. Hmm. Badly. The look, however, was perfect. I just had to make sure that I didn't try to do too much at one time. The finished strips are only going to be um, about two inches wide. So uh, cutting them down uh, at this point really didn't matter because the finished product, I'd like it to be longer than three inches, but it can't be. So they were about two 
uh, and seven eighths inches long and uh, two inches wide and that was as big as I could make one. That is to say that is as big as the finished pieces could be. The rough pieces that I ran through the corrugator were about three times that width and then I cut them down with scissors once I had them corrugated into the proper sizes before staining them and weathering them. Well, they don't look bad just like this. I think they could be used in a, in a natural state and not weathered, but I plan on weathering them. Now, if you're working in a smaller scale like Steve does, um, you're going to have to use something other than the paint squeezer it just because it makes too big of a corrugation. So what he's actually done here is taken brass rods, uh, about 30 thousandths uh, brass rods, and soldered those to a plate. You could do the same thing by just using evergreen plastic rods and gluing them to a piece of plastic. And then he's burnishing the aluminum foil down on the top of that. Now, if you're working in the smaller scales, uh, HO or possibly N, um, you're going to probably need to use a finer foil. I don't know, you could try this heavier foil, but uh, if you do use like a kitchen foil, you'll have to reinforce it. So after it's all weathered and stained, I would suggest coating the back of it with the medium thick super glue and then hitting that with some kicker to give it some stiffness and rigidity or you'll destroy it. Now, we can see here on Steve's railroad a couple of places where he's used his O-scale panels. And that just it looks really, really neat. But he's got these buildings right here. I mean, he's got more than these two. But this outhouse has a really, 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 really beat up uh, tin roof on it. And over here by the Winder store, uh, this little outbuilding over here also has a, a tin roof. Anyway, back to our project. I ultimately ended up cutting these panels down a little smaller than I had intended. I, the, the actual panels are two feet wide, and so I was thinking of making these a little over two inches wide, but the proportions just didn't look right. And in order to get it to, to look like the actual panels, I found that I had to cut these down to more like an inch and a half. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a cheat, but it looks just fine once it's up on the building. And then they're going to overlap and be staggered like this once they're onto the building. I've seen whole buildings made out of this, mostly poultry barns. Yeah, it's a pretty common building material. Right. And, and again, it could be used in this more natural state like this. Um, it's aluminum, and so you can't solder to it. But I could see building an entire structure out of this. Sure. In fact, I have an idea. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Uh, you know, at some point we're going to be building the lantern shop over in the switching yard for the switching lanterns. And I'm thinking some of these panels are going to end up over there. Yes. Anyway, let's take a look at the weathering process. So this is the stuff that I used. It's ferric chloride. It's an acid that they use for etching uh, circuit boards, electronic circuit boards. You definitely need to go careful with this. It's very, very dangerous. It gives off fumes, and so you need to use it. I, I took it outside uh, because it gives off so many fumes. Uh, later on, I also put on rubber gloves. At first, I was using my bare hands, but never touching the material. I was using tweezers, but I still found that rubber gloves were a smart idea. And then a smock, because if this stuff gets on you, it'll ruin whatever it touches. Now, because these chemicals are going to pretty much destroy everything they touch, we ran over to Walmart and bought these little silverware trays, these plastic trays, uh, to do the etching in. Etchant's going to go in one of them, and in the other one, I've already mixed up a batch of soda water, just baking soda and water, and as much uh, baking soda in there in suspension as I could get in there. So it's, it's pretty heavy in soda. I also found later on that it was best if I had a great big bowl of just plain water to throw things in rather than let them dry with the soda on them because it, it cakes up on there. Although allowing a small amount of the soda to cake on there can be a really neat effect. It can really look like crusty rust on the metal. As with all weathering, it's a rather creative process and you just you kind of have to just go with it. See what's happening and experiment and just go with what looks good. So I'm donning some eye protection here and I think we're pretty much ready to start. 
Now, depending on the temperature of the acid, it may go off really quickly and it may go off kind of slowly. Uh, the sun was shining on here and so they took off pretty fast. Moreover, the more you use it, it, it generates its own heat and each panel that you do is going to go off a little bit faster than the one before. And then into the soda and you can see that the soda starts turning this gray color. That's the uh, aluminum oxide coming off of the aluminum and staining the, uh, the soda water down here. Eventually this soda water will get so thick with aluminum that you may have to actually change it out. I just kept using it even though it got thicker and thicker and thicker. It still worked just fine. But as I say, these first panels I just set to one side to dry. And then uh, as they started building up more and more with the soda, I realized it would be better if I threw them in a great big bowl of just plain water uh, to rinse off some of that soda. You can see that at this point they're only going into the acid for a few seconds, maybe 10-15 seconds. I did leave a few of them in for much longer uh, to really, really weather them down. And in fact, I stood them on end so that it etched one whole end of it completely away uh, to create a really rusted out panel. And that process worked really well. Now again, uh, this is going rather quickly because my acid is really heated up at this point. When you first start this, if your acid is, is just kind of a room temperature, it's going to go pretty slow. You might have to leave the panels in for over a minute. And again, take a look at that soda. It's almost a thick paste at this point, but I didn't mind. I, I, but at this point, I did have to start uh, throwing my panels into rinse water. You can also see I've donned gloves at this point. Probably should have had those on all along. Anyway, there are my panels. Now you can see that they're a really dark color. They're almost black. But as they dry out, they get uh, lighter and their true colors start coming out. Most of them are going to turn to a much rustier color. Some of them are going to maintain some of this black staining and uh, you're going to see the the true nature of these and the colors revealed as they dry out and slowly slowly over time and in fact over hours they become a brighter and brighter rust color it's sure fun to watch these things come to life as they dry isn't that neat oh it, they go all kinds of colors it's it's hot it is <laughs> <laughs> but you never know what you're going to get until you get it but as they dry out, each one takes on a, a different character and a different nature. That's unbelievable. I love it. <laughs> Again, it, it's giving me just tons and tons of ideas uh, for things that I may even want to change on this structure. Who can say? Now, on some of them, I hadn't really wiped them off. I let the, uh, the soda stay on the surface so that it created kind of a crusty, uh, rusty quality to it and then on others I wiped that crust away and on a few I even sort of burnished that all the way down to the silver metal so that in a few places the silver metal was coming through. Again it's weathering and it's a very creative process and well you just kind of go with it. Here you can see where I've brought some of the silver metal up through the rust and I like that effect a lot. Most of them I left like this. I just left them as really stained, rusty panels. Uh, I thought that would look best on the building. A few of them that I'd left in the acid longer and uh, didn't wipe any of the soda off of really came out looking crusty. I added a little crimp to this one too to make it really look beat up. But uh, for the most part, each one came out a little bit different. They all, each one has its own character and its own nature. And uh, once they're all together up on the building, then that really looks neat. I also realized at this point that I probably don't have enough of these. I don't think you can have enough of those with all the projects we've got in mind. So I, I decided to, to go back into the process and, and make just tons and tons and tons of these because we can always just have them on hand. Absolutely. There's always some use for these, I'm sure. And they're so simple to make. They are. Now, as they, they all come out a little bit different, I sort of color graded them. I separated them by the really rusty ones versus the darker color ones. 
Uh, that panel there on the lower right is one of the ones that I let stand edge uh, on end in the acid for quite a while. And you can see that the acid ate the whole end of that away. That looks really neat. Not sure how I'll use it, but it's really neat. So these are the panels that I selected to use for my roof. This is the roof on the very top part of the tower up in the pulley room. And I'm going to adhere those panels with this stuff. It's double stick tape. Uh, everybody's had bad experiences with double stick tape, but this stuff works pretty well, this fast cap. Uh, and Karen and I use it for a lot of things. The key to, to double stick tape is to not abuse it, not think it can do things that it can't do. But in this particular case, it's going to work out just, just fine. I'm going to seal the seams, however, with a medium grade uh, cyanoacrylic, a thicker uh, super glue to, to help seal the, the seams and edges up uh, without getting any of it out on the surface because it's shiny. At any rate, I just continued putting panels overlapping one row of, of ridge there, one of the ridge rows, as I went all the way across, and then I was ready to put the, the second row on. And I found here that I could actually just cut these panels exactly in half to get uh, twice as much usage out of them. And so that's what I did, and it makes just pretty much the right amount of overlap there. And if the seams come up slightly, that looks really neat. Now, when you cut these things with scissors, it does tend to sort of crimp down the edge that you cut. But in this case, it didn't matter because I'm going to put that edge uh, up at the top of the roof, uh, leaving my open edge at the bottom. I also had to cut one of these panels vertically this way uh, so that my seams overlap as I go across so that they're staggered uh, like, a, like a brick pattern. Now, in this case, I really did have to be careful to apply a little bit of the medium thick CA under the panel where it overlaps the other one. I didn't want an edge there that I might snag and, and peel up and peel the whole roof up. Anyway, there's one side of the roof all put together with just a little bit of irregularity and just a small amount of seams coming up. And I think that looks really, really nice. That's that's the look I was after. That really looks authentic, like a, an old roof on an old building. I'm just I'm thrilled with how it turned out. Oh, me too. I think I've seen this building. Exactly. <laughs> In various counties here and around uh, Utah and, and Nevada and stuff. Anyway, it's perfect. It's exactly what I had in mind. Just need a roof cap now. Mm -hmm. So I made the roof cap by just cutting some strips of the aluminum and then just wrap that around the edge of the workbench. That worked really well. And I've seen you do similar. Exactly. Uh, it's just if sometimes you need a round corner on something like this, and if you can just find the exact right shape, you can just wrap it right around there. Right. In this case, it was the edge of the workbench right in front of me. There you go. <laughs> Well, if you haven't been over to the channel, do pop on over to the channel. And if you're not a subscriber, here comes the blue button. Are we ready for it? Right there, the blue button. Well, we're not sure how you found this video, the first video on the Colleen Tower on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here on Tuesday with some attic stuff. Yes. <laughs>